everyone, welcome back to 2UTV. My name is Alex Isaac and I am here today with Anne Helen Peterson. Anne Helen Peterson is a senior culture writer at BuzzFeed, known for her book, The Rise and Reign of the Unruly Woman, and also has a PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. So welcome Anne, thank you for coming here. Thank you, it's great happy to be here. Yes, okay, so um, first just a couple questions about your personal life and your trajectory from undergrad um, in, you, where, where, your undergrad wasn't in Idaho? Was no, it was in Washington State, Washington State. Whitman College. Okay. Yeah. So from your undergrad, through your PhD, and then to BuzzFeed. Mm -hmm. So what first drew you to thinking about um, culture critically? Hmm, I, you know, I think that I always was kind of engaged in thinking about these questions. Uh, even in junior high and high school, I was really obsessed with Entertainment Weekly, mm -hmm. and we got it at the beginning of its run in the early 90s, and every week, so it would come on Wednesday, and I would read it for, like, cover to cover. This is when Entertainment Weekly was a lot more robust than it has become now, and you know, they would be talking about all of these things inside the industry, like things that were happening with Miramax and independent film in the 1990s. I, like, all of the films, there was no way they were coming to my small town in Idaho, but I like knew everything, the discourse about the crying game, even though I didn't see the crying game for like 10 more years. Uh, but so that I think should have been my first clue. Uh, but I was really into math, like I thought I was going to be a math major. Um, yeah, and my mom is a math professor. So, and that just seemed like an interesting way to go. That changed like my first semester in college. I uh, I took I was taking calculus three, and then I also was somehow got into this class. I thought it was going to be an English class, but it turned out it was actually like a Western film class. Oh, cool. Okay. And uh, it was kind of like an intro class, and this was uh, taught by someone who had a PhD in film studies, but was in the English department. So it was like kind of a tricky move. Yeah. And. That was the first time that I like learned about classic stars, and I learned about genre theory, and we watched all of these old westerns, which are so great. Um, and I think that that just opened my eyes to thinking about film, and especially film history through uh, like this critical lens. I don't think that my undergrad actually provided like my particular undergrad route was very much more in like film appreciation. I got you. Okay. Which is like movies, amazing. You know what I mean? Like that's and I do like sometimes undergraduate degrees, not what you guys are doing here, but sometimes they are more in that line. Yeah. And it wasn't I thought I could still like you know, and I wrote a undergraduate thesis, honors thesis that was a hundred pages long. Like I I was complicating the movies awesome but even that theme like my thesis was I watched three movies that I really loved uh, during the summer before my senior year and I was like what do these three movies have in common and then tried to write a thesis about it it was about a uh, grieving voice in post 9-11 cinema okay. this was in 2002 so oh, that was wow. appropriate yeah. uh, and I then I like graduated and I knew that I wanted to go to grad school because it seemed like a route. Like it seemed, I was so scared of the idea of interviewing for jobs or, the, I, you have to remember too that this period was before everyone was getting internships all the time. You know, so like my friends and I during the summer, like people worked as raft guides or went and babysat or I worked as a camp counselor. Mm -hmm. um, so no one really had that job experience. So I was like, I don't know how to apply for jobs. Like, what's a way? How can I have a career? Oh, I can go to grad school, and then when I graduate, yeah. there are jobs. Ooh, yeah. Great. That was wrong, um, but, but that's how I, how I thought of it. Um, so I graduated, moved with all my friends to Seattle, mm -hmm. um, kind of re like recreated the college experience in some ways, which a lot of people do when they graduate. Um, yeah, totally. We like lived in the same house, or not the same house, but like my same friends mm -hmm. in a different house. And I was a nanny. I was a full-time nanny. I didn't like live with them, but yeah. which was whenever they napped, I watched movies. This is the beginning of Netflix when the CDs would come or the DVDs would come in the mail. Yeah, and you'd pop them in. Yeah, and them back. yeah, right. exactly. Um, so that was an easy way for me to have access to all different types of movies and even early television. Um, early like prestige television 
And then I applied for grad schools and ended up at the University of Oregon, which has a cinema studies program within their film program. Okay. So. And that's how you got to. That's how I got to star studies, yeah. Star studies it's a long answer to your good question. It's okay. Mm -hmm. um, so the biggest thing I think when I think about state, and I think this is very true for a lot of kids my age, is they mm -hmm. think of the quizzes, yeah. they think of the listicles with the gifts, right. and celebrities talking while holding cats. You know? <laughs> so when you hear that BuzzFeed has this cultural discourse section, this new section, everyone's yeah. a little like, oh no, like BuzzFeed, like, that can't be, you know, a yeah. news source. So taking that in mind, how would you explain what you do for BuzzFeed? to those people right. and sort of argue that, you know, oh no, it's not just the quizzes. And right. So I would say like, oh, have you been watching like How I Met Your Mother on CBS? Would you say like, oh, there's a show like, I don't know, some dumb reality show, but you can't believe that there's CBS News or that there's NBC News, mm -hmm. right? Like a company can have these different components to it mm -hmm. that are different, that help you know, the money that CBS earns f earned from How I Met Your Mother makes all of their foreign correspondence possible, okay. right? So, like, I look at the quizzes, and I'm like, these quizzes are great. Like, they make it so that I can do reporting yeah. anywhere that I want. Right. Um, so that's how, that's one way to think of it. Um, and I, you know, I often challenge people <laughs> to, like, have more sophisticated thoughts than, like, oh, this stupid thing can't also be smart. Like, all the time we're looking at things that are ostensibly, uh, you know, pop culture, trash culture, all these things. And as academics, as students of film and popular culture, you're always thinking about what's the smart way to think about this thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, something can have many different balances. Also, making those quizzes is really hard. I they, <laughs> yeah, like, you know, there was like knockoff websites when I yeah. was like in high school. I was like, right. I can do this. And then just, it's hard. It's, yeah. it's difficult to do. And like, I always wonder though, like how when you, you put like six different vegetables, how do you associate that with the zodiac? <laughs> like, how do, how, what's that? This is why I don't do quizzes. <laughs> yeah, I don't do that. But um, the other thing that I'll say though is that um, every time I write a longer piece on BuzzFeed, they're, like the first comment is like, wow, I can't believe this is on BuzzFeed. Like this is really smart or whatever. Right. And what I like is like that's the last time that that person can say that because now they've been introduced essentially to the news section where we're doing that sort of thing all the time. I yeah. got you. Yeah. So talking more about BuzzFeed, you have some mm -hmm. great articles on BuzzFeed, um, some of them have been viral, obviously. Um, so I want to go into a few of those and just ask a little bit about those. Yeah. But one thing I have, in general, that I've noticed about your writing is oftentimes you insert yourself in the narrative, mm -hmm. which I think is something you can't necessarily do in academic writing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's very removed, I think, mm -hmm. from the author, whereas, you know, the introduction of this book. Um, your article about burnout, you mm -hmm. put your own story into it and interweave it. Um, so how do you, how do your own experiences figure into your intellectual pursuits? You know, I think I come from a training um, in feminist media theory, which oftentimes the academic does put themselves into the article, if only simply to position themselves to whatever thing that they're writing about, right? Because you have to think about, okay, so how am I approaching this object differently as someone who is a person of color or um, a first generation college student or an immigrant, you know, all of these different things. And that became kind of a popular, is not the right word, but a standard thing in a lot of feminist scholarship to acknowledge your positionality towards whatever thing that you were writing about. Okay. So that, like, that was part of it. Also, my training, um, when I was in college, even as I was doing like the film appreciation stuff, I was also taking a lot of creative writing, like nonfiction essay, mm -hmm. which is essentially what I do now. So a lot of that um, personal essay style, like that's something that I was also cultivating. So this is kind of just a mashup of the two. Yeah. And it also, you know, I didn't want to do the first person in the beginning of the book. Really? Yeah, I was okay. like, or, or I didn't want to do nearly as much of it. And my editor was like, nope, more, totally more. And what it does is that the rest of the book is very analytical, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, I try to make it readable, but it still is trying to do analysis of these stars. Mm -hmm. But I, you want something when you're reading a book that isn't an academic textbook. Like, even though you guys are reading this in class, it's not an academic textbook. Yeah. 
um, you want something that allows an entryway into the piece. And oftentimes, the personal, even if it's not exactly your story or someone else's story, it still makes it feel like, oh, there's a human writing this. Right. You know what I mean? Interesting. Yeah. Right. So um, looking at your article, How Millennials Became the Burnout Generation, you note that, uh, quote, yet more work we do, the more efficient we've proven ourselves to be, the worse our jobs become. We get lower pay, worse benefits, less job security. Um, so it's kind of a terrifying relationship when you think about it. Yeah. You know, we do more work, and yet we're given less yeah. in the long run. Um, so in the narratives you've heard and in your own life, how have you seen this playing out? And then how do you see it playing out for future generations? So for my age or Gen Z. Right. Well, I saw it in academia, just in terms of um, the number of qualifications that were necessary in order to graduate with your PhD and then get a job. Like, it used to be... Oh, if you've published one peer-reviewed article, you're almost assured a job. Okay. And then that turned into, oh, well, you need like two or three at least. Mm. Uh, and now it's like you need a book under contract. Wow. Um, but also the jobs that you're interviewing for are less secure, are adjunct jobs sometimes, which means that there's not any job security and you've paid a lot less and don't necessarily have health care or any other benefits. Um, or they're just, you know, asking a lot more of you. So teach four classes instead of every semester instead of two or three, but also advise all these students and also run this other part of the school that like is not really part of teaching, you know what right, I mean? Exactly. Like you become, sometimes you do like the job of three people instead of one person. Okay. And because you want a job, because you're desperate and it's the thing that you've trained to do and it also oftentimes is the thing you love to do. Mm -hmm. You're like, this is fine, right? right. You, you, tell yourself the story that this is fine, mm -hmm. even though it's not fine, right. you know? And, and oftentimes, academics always joke about like, oh, I told someone about the job market, like told someone who's not an academic about what it's like to get a job and like the kind of jobs we accept. And they're like, what is wrong with you? You know, like you have to have that outside perspective because mm -hmm. you're so inured to it. Uh, but I think this is true too with um, outside of academia with a lot of jobs, um, whether it's in, you know, production, like filmmaking and television production, or uh, just uh, permalancing, so like trying to freelance and, and putting together a bunch of jobs and like a company that you're working for. You're clearly a full-time worker for them, but they don't want to pay your benefits, so they keep you classified as what's called a permalancer. Mm -hmm. Or even something like at Walmart, where they're like, okay, so again, we don't want to give this person benefits, right. so we're going to have them work 39 hours a week instead of 40. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Well, that's utterly depressing. No. <laughs> oh, but I want to answer the second part of your question, okay. which is that I think that millennials right now, part of the, the response to that article mm -hmm. that I received and that I am feeling myself is that, like, we're fed up with this. Yes. Right? Like, something needs to change. Right. And millennials are just coming into positions of political and corporate leadership. Mm -hmm. And that's... I do think it's possible, yeah. right? And so, so your generation, which actually, you know, like you, as old Gen Z, you are not that different from millennials, right? Just right. like young Gen X is not that different from millennials. There's a lot of overlap in those So much, yes. right? And so you can either like think like, okay, we are gonna be the generation that is also going to be unsatisfied with this. Mm. Um, or you can just, be like, well, this is the way it is. Like, that's the way I think it is sometimes, like, a generation. Either they're complacent, mm -hmm. and they decide, like, okay, well, I guess this is just how it is. The planet is dying. We're done. Or, and you see this, actually, with a lot of people who are slightly younger mm -hmm. than you guys, like, in high school students who have been walking out en masse in protest yeah. for climate change and that exactly. sort of thing. Like, and with um, what's happened in, uh, with the Parkland teens, like, mm -hmm. There is, there is a, a hunger for there to, things to be different, yeah. and they're not yet disillusioned. You are not let, yet disillusioned that, like, oh, I guess this is just the way things are. Right. So, I'm hopeful. There is hope. <laughs> yeah. Basically. Um, okay, in that same article, you say that the way for now to fix burnout is to acknowledge it and just say this is the reality. Um, kind of looking back on that article now that you've had some distance from it, how would you 
would you stand by that? Or do you think like it's a more nuanced answer? Or like, what's your relationship with that now? So the way I think of it is that article, instead of being prescriptive, right, like giving you a prescription, like, OK, now that you know that you have burnout, here are the five things that you need to do, okay. right, to fix it. Yeah. A lot. Of, there's been stuff that's done that for a really long time, and then you like try to follow those things, and then you feel like a failure and more burnt out because you're trying failing at burning or curing your burnout, exactly. right? Yes. And also, everyone's burnout is remarkably different. Mm -hmm. So, instead of being prescriptive, I wanted to be like make. A, I want to be diagnostic. Mm -hmm. So instead of trying to fix you, just getting us as readers, me as an author, like us as a generation, to admit that this is a thing, mm -hmm. to give it a name, right? Because that was the revelation for me, is that I did not think I had burnout. Yeah. I just thought I was living my life. And lots of other people who responded to the piece, too, were like, did not realize that they had burnout. Yeah. Um, and so, but once you name it, it's so much easier to be honest with yourself mm -hmm. about what's going on. Interesting. So... Like, you can't change your habits unless you realize that there's something going on with your habits that's making you feel bad all the time. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. so, like, um, and for me personally, like, I have tried, to, like, to be a lot more mindful with my social media. I've deleted all these different apps from my phone. I turn my plane, phone on airplane as soon as I, like, go downstairs towards, like, the bedroom because, oh, guess what? Like, reading an actual book is way better for your head than just scrolling forever through Instagram with right. no purpose. Uh, but it's a totally ongoing process. And it would be totally dishonest to think that somehow I wrote this article and then like everything was fixed. Right. Like I struggle with it all the time. And I think that's good to acknowledge. Yeah. So now she can use it for your book. Mm -hmm. um, I loved it. I thought it was great. Great. <laughs> I thought it was great. <laughs> but originally, um, you wrote this book in 2016, 2015? Yeah. And so, published in 2017. Mm -hmm. It's only been two years later, but if you were to write the book today, yeah. what would change? Would you choose different figures? Do you think there would be different central themes? Mm -hmm. um, different case studies? It's great that you're asking that, because it's part of what I'm talking about um, in my talk. Okay. But, uh, yeah, it seems to me, in a lot of ways, a a very pre-Trump book, mm -hmm. right? Like I had to redo the introduction in, in Hillary Clinton chapter because I turned it in and then Trump was elected and so I had to shift some of the parts of it. Right. But um, that unruliness was very much of a pre-Trump moment mm -hmm. and there were signs of this backlash coming but they weren't as discernible as after the election. Right. And so I think like one thing, you know, the rise, reign, and rejection of the unruly woman would be, you know, part of it. Yeah. I think like any pop cultural book, as time passes from the moment that it was written, then some of those figures become less pertinent. Um, and, and also there are other people like Serena Williams or Kim Kardashian who have become unruly in very different ways. Mm -hmm. Right, and so Serena Williams through uh, motherhood and conversations about her motherhood and, and her health and all this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And like Kim Kardashian has become a very outspoken political advocate. Mm -hmm. uh, so adding texture in that way, but then there's so many other, like every year there's new people, right? right? Like there, we are still, like unruliness never goes away. Mm -hmm. The way that celebrities negotiate it is different mm -hmm. um, and dependent upon the societal moment. But yeah, I think uh, it would just, like I could write, you know, every year you could add like, write oh, an okay. addendum, Another you know, like and just make a not massive tomb of like, well, women. Well, you women. to do second more additions too, I feel like. Yeah. You, know, you could add, there's, it's a topic that you could add more to. Right. So who got the cut? Were there any women that you wanted to put in, but it didn't get? Well, I wrote an Amy Schumer chapter, okay, and that actually got the cut, like the whole finished chapter, because wow. it was just it was a weird time in Amy Schumer's career when I was writing it, and it was when she like there was a lot of it, her unruliness was primarily manifested at that time through her show, mm -hmm. and not as much in her personal life where she. There's just some interesting decisions that she made. And that actually could have been a, a fascinating discussion, but I also was kind of like, there's too many white ladies in this book. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I added the Serena Williams chapter, which became the first chapter, and yeah. I, like, I think that it sets the tone for what it comes afterwards in a really great way. No, I totally agree. It's really interesting, like, reading it in order, because you can see there's themes between certain mm -hmm. women. Yeah. Like, it's ordered very strategically, yeah. which I appreciate. So yeah. Like, all this thought put into this. Well, and also, besides the Serena Williams chapter, which I wrote last, mm -hmm. everything else, that was the... That was how I wrote it. Like that was the order that I really? wrote it in. Okay. So those themes were developing in my mind as I continued to go through them. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. So a few fast questions yeah. before we end. Okay. Lightning round. Yeah. How great was Paul Newman? Uh, <laughs> Paul Newman is the best. <laughs> Google you guys just Google Paul Newman hot. Like that's all you need to do. You'll, you'll understand. Which I state is the best? <laughs> Which I state? Um. Justin will want me to say Indiana, but it's Idaho. Wrong, it's Illinois. <laughs> both are wrong. Have you been to Illinois? No, I'm from St. Louis. It's really not the best. Okay, which do you like better, everything in Montana yeah. everything in New York? Montana. Yeah, why? Yeah. I mean, I can visit New York whenever I want. Uh, Montana <laughs> is like the most beautiful place in the United States. So. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, do you consider Tulsa a Midwest city? I have learned a lot about this in you know the last 36 hours that really? I've been here. Okay. That Tulsa people, Oklahomans, think of it as part of the Midwest, which which makes sense because like what else? Are you, like you're not Southwest, mm -hmm. right? You're not Texas. Um, so you know where does you're this go? Like, you know, yeah, you're not South. Right. Yeah, okay. it's unique. It is unique. Um, and finally, just to wrap it all up, what is the next big project you're working on? I am writing a burnout book. You are? Yeah. Exciting. So that, I'm going to write it this summer, okay. and it should come out hopefully like January or February of next year. That's awesome. So are you thinking stories from the people that you talk to and that have reached out to you about it, like doing kind of like a bunch of interviews, or are you thinking more analysis sort of what this book is like? Um, it's going to be a mix, so it will incorporate some stories from people talking about their own burnout, but then also, you know, like, the original article, the burnout article was like 7,800 words. Okay. My original draft was like 12,000 words. There's just so much more I could talk about in each of those areas, yeah. and you can expand on it a lot, so going deeper on those questions. That's fascinating. Well, I can't wait to read it. I'm excited to see what else you write. Thank you so much for sitting down with us today. It's been great having you. That was great. Yeah, that was fun. Thank you so much. Yeah. I say Justin prepped me for the eye question. <laughs>